Mercantile Bank focuses on entrepreneurs and helping them with their banking services. Mm. CEO Cole Kumbia is here to discuss more. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Matthew. Yeah, so, so just a bit about, about the segment that, that, that you're in. You really are focusing on, on entrepreneurs. And, and how is this uh, a focus and, and how does it differentiate from, say, Capitec and Investec? Okay. I think, um, yeah, we're the only bank in the country that only focuses on entrepreneurs. So our sole purpose in life is actually to, to grow entrepreneurs. And we've been banking entrepreneurs for 50 years now. And if, as you look at the banking industry as well, we've, there's only five banks in the country that are part of every single payment stream. Yeah, and we, we're the fifth. So in other words, you're able to offer every single product like debit card, credit card, foreign exchange. And then we looked at it a few years ago. We sat down as a senior team and we said, um, yeah, yeah, what is our strategy? Yeah, where, where do we want to take this bank? And we thought to ourselves, we looked at the various segments in the market. Uh, the big banks have been around for over 100 years, yeah, 100 to 150, some of them. And, uh, and even APSA was like an amalgamation of a whole lot of banks that have been around forever. And then you look at it and you say, suddenly Capitec hits the scene and they've only been around 15 years and they're opening 100,000 new accounts every single month. They've got millions of customers and you say, how is it possible they can suddenly take all this, you know, th th this market share? Uh, and then you look at someone like an Investec, who's also only been around maybe 35, 40 years, which is young from a banking point of view, and you say, uh, how come they hit the, you know, they did so well you know, in, the, in the private banking space? And our view is that both of those segments were very badly serviced. So, so the big banks thought you couldn't make money out of the low income group, and Capitec came along with a very transparent, cheap offering, very easy to use, branches were open late at night, so they just did something different. Yeah. And they're absolutely cleaning up there. And I think, and if you look at Investec, yeah, I think the, the big banks thought you, they had the private banking model, right? And they came with something completely different with this very relationship-driven model. And they, they've done really well in the, in the private banking space. So now, if you look at the rest of the segments, you know, we cannot compete on corporate investment banking, the big banks to, to, to get there. You can't compete on, on the retail banking side because you haven't got footprint. But the one segment of the market I feel is very badly serviced is SMEs. You, know, you speak to anyone with their own business, they'll tell you that their relationship manager changes every few months, you're dealing with call centers, the turnaround times are slow, et cetera. So we think we can make a real difference you know, in this space. Okay, so Investec and Capitec, as you have said, are succeeding. Yeah. Are you succeeding? How, what strategy are you using to succeed there? Yeah, so we, um, so we, we came up with that strategy a few years ago. We sat with a senior team and we said, we want to grow the bank. So first is the growth strategy. So, we, um, so you can either grow the bank organically or you can grow it through acquisitions. So we made one acquisition a few years ago. We, we liked the rental finance industry. And that's like, a, I suppose, if you look at it, like a, a SAS from their main uh, part of their business is the, the, you know, the rental finance side. So it's lots, uh, Nash will sell a photocopier and then they ask the customer, would you like to rent it? And you say yes, and they have to go through a finance company. So we like that part of the business as well because you, it's a very, um, like a granular portfolio from a risk point of view, lots of small little deals and it's all SMEs. So we made an acquisition in that space uh, and we managed, when we bought the business, it was called Custom Capital, we've now changed it to Mercantile Rental Finance. When we bought the business, its, uh, it's lending book was 34 million, all to SMEs. And we're now sitting five years later on 700 million. Yeah, so we've grown it tremendously. Then we looked at the rest of our business, our core business, and we said, well, um, we, how do we go and target new customers? We haven't got a strong brand out there and we don't lose customers. So when a customer joins us, they, they, you know, they stick around. So we, you know, obviously doing something right there. So what we went and did was we, uh, we built the first private bank in the country that's only for entrepreneurs. So if you've got your own business, then you qualify. It's the black credit card, loyalty scheme and everything. And the whole idea is to hook the customer through a product like a home loan, uh, offer them great service, and then we get their business later. Yeah? So we launched that. We've now have, uh, we opened a thou we opened a thousand accounts now for private banking, and we've, um, we've grown our home loan book also to 700 million in the space of two years now, for, you know, in, the, in the private banking space. Then we set up, we thought in the SME segment, you know, the big banks have got these investment banking skills at a high level. Uh, and we thought no one's really doing it in the SME space. So we set up a, a leveraged finance unit that actually concentrates on helping an entrepreneur either buy another business uh, or buy, do a very complicated property transaction. Uh, where we sometimes take a little bit of uh, equity in the, in the property through, a, through, we don't physically take equity, but it's like an option and we, we take a property. And uh, so we built that team. And that team's flying, you know, doing really well. And then our treasury space, we've got a dealing room where all our customers, if you want to trade foreign exchange, you, um, you just, um, you basically phone a dealer and you, and you can trade. But because we weren't growing our own customer base very fast, and that business had been flat for like five years, we said to ourselves, um, we, uh, 60, we looked at the numbers and 65% of the revenue came from brokers, like intermediaries. And we love partnering with, uh, with, uh, with intermediaries who, who can bring, bring us business. So we said, well, let's become the best bank in the industry f only for you know, uh, servicing intermediaries. So we built a online trading platform uh, that basically links directly into intermediary. They upload all the information, make it very easy to open accounts. 
and uh, we've grown that business unbelievably. You know, the first year we grew at 30%, we then grew 20%, grew another 20. So we'll make about 100 million this year revenue out of, out of the business. So if you add all of these things together over the space of like four or five years now of building all of this, uh, we've last year's results, we have had our record year. So we've grown our, our lending book uh, 20% to 8.7 billion, all to SMEs. And there was 2 billion of new loans to SMEs uh, for, for last year. We grew our deposit base uh, uh, 26% because we also we launched a new product for uh, law firms. So we said we don't want to target the large law firms. We want to go middle. That's our market and below. And we 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 try and get trust funds through them. Also through opening great uh, uh, quick service for opening accounts and you know having good relation with the guys. So we grew our, our deposit base like over the last years 1.6 billion just through that product. And then um, and then on our profits we've grown 21% you know last year. And you look at the industry, it's very it's quite a tough market at the moment. So we're very proud about those results. Then our long-term funding, we had to also get some long-term funding. We grew that um, 30%. Yeah, we've got a great relationship with International Finance Corporation. They've lent us money. Uh, a bank in Macau has lent us money. Yeah, so it's, uh, we, we're securitizing our rental finance books, so there's long-term funding there. So, so now we had a very good year last year. So it's all starting to come together. Yeah. And I see you've, um, you've partnered quite well with, with Yoko. Talk a little bit about the fintech space and how okay. you and how you um, partnering there. It sounds yeah. really quite uh, innovative. Yes, okay. So now Yoko is a very innovative little company that started out here in Cape Town, a guy called Katrejo, he, he, he started the business. And, and what, yeah, when we sat back as Mercantile and we said, geez, yeah, f we're a small bank. We don't have uh, huge teams that can go look for re research and development and see what's happening out there. Or yeah, we don't have developers sitting there all day just trying to develop. We said, we want to do the basics right. So we're really good electronic banking. We've got mobile banking offering now. So we do all of that. You c yeah, we, we don't want to be worse than the big banks. We want to be uh, yeah, at least the same or, or better. Uh, and then we, we grow market share through our relationships. Then we said, okay, if we want uh, to be innovative with that, we'd rather partner with fintech companies. Yeah, there's lots of fintech companies out there. So like as an example on the treasury business, that online trading platform, mm. there was a, comp a crowd came to us. Yeah, just two people. They came to us and said, this is, this is the way I want to build. Uh, would we partner with them? They'll incur all the costs of building it and we just pay them a fee per transaction. And we said, fantastic. So now Yoko came along and said, right, they um, want to go into the mobile uh, point of sale device, right? So in other words, it's a little gadget that clicks onto an iPad or onto a mobile phone. It's a very small in, uh, businesses. So entrepreneurs have got like maybe you got you got like a little restaurant or something like that, and you want to be able to accept payment, and you don't want to really have this big bulky machine, a credit card machine, or it's too expensive. And also the transaction fees are really low. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're in the very high elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. So so they uh, so so Yoko said came in there and they come come up with a complete solution where your 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 smartphone or your iPad device links in with your toll system. You've got this little device that clicks in, and you can accept payment now. So they came to us and said. This is what they, they're building. Uh, we loved it, and we, we don't offer that, you know, the, the, the mobile POS device. So we said, well, you know, come use our license, come yeah. rent our license. So they, um, they pay us a fee per transaction. So we're very happy because we're getting this massive volume coming through sure. our system, and they're very happy because now they don't have to go and spend, uh, you know, they, they haven't got a banking license, and now they can, they can enter the market. Yeah. It's a brilliant collaboration there. No, it's fantastic. And it's, as I say, and, they've, and it's so nice to see um, when you partner with the right, because obviously you're getting approaches all the time, but you, you don't want to just go and sign everyone up. But when we, we when these guys presented us, we just said, similar to when we do business with the SMEs, we, yeah. it's 90% of the decisions of the jockey. We look at this person and say, wow, this person's passionate about their business. They know what they're talking about. They've done all their homework. They've invested everything they have into this business. These guys are the same. We said, wow, we love the, yeah, love what they're able to offer. And um, yeah, come come join us. So the volumes are going through the roof at the moment. Yeah. But you, you give off that impression of being an entrepreneur yourself as opposed to the, you know, the other bank yeah. banks in the country where it's very corporate. <laughs> yeah. Now look, at we're a very entrepreneurial uh, bank. I think we we uh, we like, if you look at our culture at Mercantile, I think yeah, banking is all about people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, if you get the people piece of the bank right, I think I think you, uh, you, you, your service ratings, you'll get that right. So we. We also about four years ago we sat down and we said how do we get the culture of this business that it's you know, that you, that we're different to any other mm -hmm. uh, any other bank or any, any other large corporate, and um, so we, we spent a lot of time and effort on our culture. It's a very flat structure. Yeah, our customers there's no hierarchy there. They want to phone me, they phone me. Yeah, they want to phone our head of commercial banking, they phone directly. We've got great relationships. We um, we very at, uh, we got a thing called the mercantile way, and one of those things is the uh, one of the items is continuous improvement. Yeah, so we every single person in the bank has to look and say how do we continuously Im improve this business. And I I told a story the other day at a, at a function we went to, and I, um, I read a book called Dream Big. I don't know if you've read it, but it's uh, it's about the guys that started uh, 3G Capital who ended up oh, wow. owning the biggest brewery in the world now, yeah. being they just bought um, South African breweries. Yeah, yeah. S.A.B. Miller. And it's a fantastic story. There's three guys from nothing created this monster you know, of, of a business. And they got a thing called, um, they only ever hired 
PhDs, right? So it's it's people f uh, with a with a they come from a poor background because yeah. I thought those people were a bit, bit more hungry. Uh, the S stood for they got to be extremely smart, right? And the D stood for they have to have a deep desire to do well. And in Mercantile, we also adopted exactly that philosophy. Not to say we're not going to hire someone from a private school or whatever, but we at Mercantile, all of our staff are ordinary, you know, ordinary people. But yeah, very energetic, very smart, understand banking. You, know, you don't get better bankers, um, and and as a result of hiring the right people and all the issues, uh, all the, um, the the stuff we implement in the, in the culture space, we did a like a staff satisfaction survey recently, the Gallup survey. It's an international uh, survey, and it's all about staff engagement to see how engaged are staff in your business. The the average worldwide is. Uh, 13%. So 13% of the staff say they engage, they understand the strategy, they know what they have to do to help achieve the strategy, etc. At Mercantile, we're on 76%. Yeah, so every, because we got a, we, we sit down twice a year with every single staff member with our strategy. It's on a one page. So we explain our target market, uh, what are our goals for the year, you know, what are we building, what are the new projects. So everyone in the bank, and then what do you as an individual have to do to help us achieve our overall goal? And this year, our overall goal is 20% growth in bottom line. And then we, Everyone knows exactly what they have to do yeah, in, in order to get there. Now, if you take all of that, what I've just said now, uh, we, uh, we've also quite proud of our service results. So we, we did the, um, the consultor customer satisfaction index. Um, so our competition is the big four banks, business banking divisions. So it's not like the small banks. Our competition is Standard Bank business banking, FMB business banking. And so we did exactly the same service ratings that they did. Uh, we did it uh, f um, yeah, th for th the last three years. And we're very proud to say we rank, rank number one in service for business banking in, in, in the country and by quite a, a long margin. And can we still improve service? For sure. But every single cent we're spending at the moment is, uh, is improving the customer experience. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about uh, transformation in the mm. banking sector. Yeah. Um, the, the president's come out and spoken quite emphatically about, mm. about the need for, mm. for transformation in the finance mm. sector. Mm. Um, and, and you know there's been a lot in the press mm. about, about the, the, the big banks dominating mm. the sector mm. and not, not enough space for, mm. for black um, business people and, and bankers mm. to come in. What is your take on this and, and where does um, uh, Mercantile fit into all of this? Yeah, okay, I think it's a, it's a very important topic and it's obviously very topical at the moment. Yeah. And uh, the next week there's, um, yeah, there's gonna be representations made into, in, you know, into to parliament. I think um, if you look at transformation, uh, I think yeah, the, yes, the dom industry is dominated by four big banks. Um, they probably have 90% market share. There are smaller players like ourselves now coming in there. And even if the market's tough at the moment, yeah, we we just say we just got to offer better service, and hopefully we'll just grow our market share by stealing market share from us. We don't worry about what the e economy is doing. But from a transformation point of view, uh, I suppose you want also to look at the banking industry to see how do they unlock transformation in the country. So it's not just a a lot of people just think when you say transformation, sure. it's all about employment equity or, or it's all about shareholding, right? Don't forget, if a, if a big bank does a, um, a, a big empowerment deal for themselves, they're locking up capital now that they could have used that capital to, to leverage their balance sheet, to lend more to SMEs and to individuals and consumers to you know, help stimulate and, and grow their economy. So it's, it's a yes, it's, it's one thing doing an empowerment deal, but you got to ask also, isn't it also very important to make sure we get loans out there to, to you know, to, uh, to black individuals or black businesses to try hope, hopefully um, stimulate the, the economy. And also, I think the one thing about banks as well, they, they've been uh, yeah, consistently profitable, I suppose, over the, over the years. You know, the, the big four, you can imagine how much they contribute to the tax system. You know, all the, these other industries have gone up and down and you have a bad year, so there's no tax collected from those businesses where the big banks are paying gazillions in, in tax. You know, so that obviously helps the e economy as well. So I can't comment on like the big banks and their own transformation but we sat down uh, fr from a mercantile point of view about four years ago as well and y yeah we, we obviously everyone's part of the financial sector charter and we looked at this whole thing and we said yeah as a small bank we're not pitching for government business we're not pitching for large corporate business we bank SMEs so do we need a good rating the answer is no because we don't use a use it to get business but we sat down and said but it's the right thing to do yeah we want to transform we think it's a this is what the country needs you have to do it um, so we sat down and we looked at the charter and every single line item in the charter, we had a plan around it. And we were also very happy to say that four years ago we were level seven um, contributor. And also we, our parent company is 100% owned by the, uh, the largest bank in Portugal. So to do an empowerment deal at the top is very difficult. So we get zero points at an ownership level because we're owned by an international bank. But um, we looked at every 
w other places where we could influence it. And we um, we've managed to go, four years ago we were level seven, then we went to a level six, then we went to level five, and now we're level four. So every single year we've come down yeah, one level. Uh, of our staff, 70% of our staff now are I ARC, yeah. Of our senior appointments now, the, the last, um, I'd say the last five senior appointments at a, a divisional head level, and you only have like 18 or so people, the last five have, have all been ARC, and the last uh, two have been African, which is also great. So, so we, there's a massive effort from our own, from ourselves to, to make sure we transform. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's a sense of a radical transformation coming yeah. forward now. I mean, the, the kind of guidelines that have been yeah. set, are they going to be pushed forward even more, and, and how would that affect your bank? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's difficult to say. So, so what is it? You know, we don't know what radical transformation is sure. yet. Yeah, you know, I think it's. Uh, but I think one must be very careful. But it's like a whole populist um, thing to say. You know, we have to radically transform because you also. I mean, the banking sector here is probably rated like number two or three in the world. Yeah. So and and that gives overseas investors confidence in our system. People overseas are investing in this in this country. It's helping obviously stimulate the economy and. Yeah, and um, yeah, and and helping with the rand, the strength of the rand, and that. So you, so you think to yourself, yeah, you got to be very careful of, I suppose, radical transformation. It, you have to transform. There's no doubt, but there has to be a proper, uh, sustainable plan going forward in order to transform both the the, you know, the economy and the and the banking sector. Because the last thing you want to do is just create the, um, the, 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 the an environment where there's no more confidence in our banking sector. Whereas at the moment, as I say, we've of the high, most highly regulated in the world. We uh, during the economic crisis, it's probably only Australia and ourselves that weren't affected by the economic crisis you know, in, the, in the late 2000s. So, it's, so I think we've done a fantastic job in that point of view. We've just got to be careful that you, you don't lose that. And then the, the people, the avoid, people um, decide to, they get scared of South Africa and start pulling their investments out of South Africa. So, so, so yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out going forward. Yeah. Great. Carl, thank, thanks very much. Okay, and your pleasure.